He says he plays only for an audience of one. Philadelphia Eagles quarterback Carson Wentz shares a message of overcoming obstacles through Jesus. Plus, this British ministry leader is working to bridge the gap between the charismatic churches and the Catholic Vatican. We talk with Dr. Richard Roberts on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. The Philadelphia Eagles moved into a tie for first place in the NFC East last week with a 31-6 win over the New York Jets. Quarterback Carson Wentz stood out as a key player by completing 17 of 29 passes and throwing for one touchdown. Well, while millions of fans cheer for Wentz, he told CBN Sports reporter Tom Buring he's playing for an audience of one. Carson Wentz plays quarterback much like he lives life, impromptu, eagerly creating plays that both score points and impact lives. The North Dakota native led the NDSU Bison to two national championships before finding the fast track to Philadelphia, becoming the face of the Eagles franchise in a journey where home still stays within reach. It always just hits me a little different when I come back home and I see kids wearing my jersey. I was that kid. I was the kid who grew up and walked these streets. I was the kid who, who was at these football camps that I might be putting on. Too much fun? Yeah. <laughs> what did the North Dakota upbringing deposit in your life, Carson? Yeah, growing up in North Dakota, I think the makeup of North Dakotans in general and, and the makeup of the Midwest, just kind of those family values and um, Christian values that are in, kind of instilled in you when you're younger. So those things have stuck with me to this day. Describe your quarterback style. I think my quarterback style is, is unique. I want to be a pocket passer first, but you know when I need to extend plays and, and do things with my legs, I'll, I'll definitely take advantage of that. I feel like I'm a gunslinger and I'm willing to take chances. I'm willing to, to force a pass here and there and playing with that mentality and, and just kind of playing freely out there. Is that a part of your personality? It is, it is. I think that kind of abstract mind and kind of playing off schedule sometimes and, and improvising, I think is, is definitely how my mind is. And it's always, it's always running, it's always going, always thinking of the next thing. And, and that's definitely how I play the game too. What's most appealing about Philly for a North Dakota guy? I absolutely just love the fans here. I love the, the passion that they bring. It's just such a unique culture in this city of, of blue collar work ethic and just a deep rooted you know, sense of belonging and, and purpose within these games. So it's so much bigger than just a Sunday afternoon football game. And they always show up, they bring their best, they bring their A game, good, bad, ugly, it doesn't matter. The fans are always there. And uh, I love that about this place. You're a part of a Super Bowl team. You positioned them to get there, but because of injury, you weren't able to see that through. Yeah. What did you take away from that win by simply supporting and watching? I mean, I learned a lot, a lot about myself. I always preach, you know, I play for an audience of one and just have that mindset. I'm always talking about it. But then when it came down to it and I wasn't able to be out there, I had to really put that faith in action, you know, and really just ultimately say, all right, God, I'm surrendering all of this to you. And it, and it was tough. And so it was definitely a journey um, that I had to take, but uh, I thank God for it in the end. Are you aware in the moment, I need to put this into practice? Yeah, you see some little things. Maybe it's just some little hardening of the heart for, or maybe some, some certain things that maybe kind of crept into the idle side. And maybe I was, you know, putting football maybe a little too much on, on that platform. And, you know, I think God was just molding me to be more like him and, and really truly value him first. And ultimately say it's, it's his. This is just a gift. This is a platform. This is ability that I, I've been given, um, but it's his. You have chosen, as you said, to narrow your audience to one. Let me hear that from you. For whom and why? I can't escape it. That's just my life motto. And the phrase audience of one, I actually have it tattooed on my wrist, AO1, came to me when I was a, a freshman in college. That's when my faith really became real to me and really became a personal relationship with Christ. And I heard someone say that phrase, a great reminder for me uh, when I'm out there playing, but it's everything I do. Serving my wife, being a son or a friend, whatever it is, the Lord is my audience. And playing Monday night football, you, you're being watched by millions or the media is writing things about you, good or bad. What matters is how God views you what he says that you are. You have the foundation under the same name, audience of one. Messaging Christianity, you guys are doing that. I think it's twofold. I think when you're, you're sharing the gospel, you're, you're verbally sharing, expressing who Christ is, but it, but it also, so many people, are, our lives are, are changed because of how you live. 
because of how you walk it out. That's something that we strive to do with the AON Foundation with Thy Kingdom Crowd, partnering with to build the Haiti Sports Complex with the outdoor ministry that we have going in the Midwest. We always want to tangibly bless somebody with an opportunity, with food, with something unique and that'll fix a physical need, but a spiritual need at the same time. That That's what it's all about. What makes Thy Kingdom Crumb unique? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is it's free. It's an opportunity for people to just open up, engage, have a community block party, and then hopefully dig a little deeper spiritually. Camp Conqueror. Yeah. What message is it you want them to remember? I mean, it is that message of overcoming, and ultimately that message of overcoming through Jesus. You know, obviously, they're going through some amazingly difficult things. And the biggest thing we want them to hold on to and cling to is that Jesus is greater than all of those things. We set them up for some amazing experiences here to leave with some amazing memories, friendships, relationships. We want to foster that environment. We want to nurture that. We want to disciple them as we leave here as well. You're learning about being a conqueror. What does that mean to you? Um, it means to like overcome your fears and just like be brave and do what you love to do. Everyone's different. Everyone's at a different place. Everyone's had a different experience with maybe the church, maybe with someone with their family. So just first and foremost, meeting people where they are, loving on people, helping them feel seen. So it's not always just about what you say to them. It's how you care for them, how you show love and respect for them. How does it evolve from cliche to conviction? about a God that wants to engage with you. Yeah, God wants me to ultimately surrender to Him, have that relationship with Him, and that's truly all that matters. So uh, for me to have my Lord Jesus Christ as my audience, it just changes my perspective on everything. So with the NFL guaranteed contract, what is personally lost when putting confidence in perceived certainty? Uh, that's a good question. You know, when you have a contract of that value, it's so easy to just rest on that. And financially, that's an amazing blessing and to not lose sight of that. But um, it's something you always got to guard against being too invested into financial success, personal success. Because at the end of the day, if your relationship with Christ is out of order, everything else is going to be a mess. Be missing the most important thing in life. An amazing insights. I play for an audience of one and then to have that tested saying, well, you're going to allow your team, you're going to take your team to be positioned for the Super Bowl, but by the way, you're not going to be, be able to play in that game. And, and then you're going to have, have to watch test, them play yeah, from the sidelines. Have that tested. Um, but it, it's an amazing what he's doing yeah. and the influence he's having. Because when you live out your faith, realize you're not just living it out for you, you're living it out for everyone around you. We are constantly spreading news, uh, and, and it's, it's very possible for bad news to take effect on you, and suddenly you're now broadcasting that bad news. For Carson, it could have been, well, I'm, I'm wounded. I, I got us here, and you know, why can't I play in the, in the big game? But in this, he learned a very valuable lesson. If you really are playing for an audience of one, what are you doing right now? And his transformation and his acceptance of that what a great message for everyone around him. Yes, football is important to him, but it's not the most important thing. Money's important. It's not the most important thing. The most important thing always is your relationship with God. Yeah, and when that's square, everything yeah. Everything with else it. lines <laughs> yeah. up. Well, New Orleans Saint linebacker Demario Davis shared good news to his social media pages. He won an appeal over a $7,000 fine for wearing a headband that said, Man of God. According to the fine, the headband violated the NFL's rule about wearing personal messages. When some fans found out, they started creating homemade hem headbands to show their support. Davis decided to partner with St. Dominic's Hospital by selling similar headbands. He posted to his social media, quote, we've raised over $30,000. Y'all helped me turn a $7,000 negative into an almost $40,000 positive, benefit benefiting people who truly do need it. The Davis family posed for a family photo sporting the headbands and wow. Oh, what a great idea. <laughs> I love this. Uh, and that's as old as the Old Testament. Yeah. The priest used to wear a headband that said, you know, a, a separation of the Lord, holiness to the mm -hmm. Lord. Uh, and you just announced to everyone you're separated. You, you know, you're not going to behave the way the world expects you to behave. I'm going to be a man of God. Yeah, well, this is another one of those things in our culture today that, you know, when you even first heard about it, you went, really? I mean, come on. Do you know? Every, it just seems like people are so fearful of anything that might offend even one. <laughs> Well, how does that offend them? Well, somebody was offended. I mean, they obviously were 
<laughs> I mean, you can point at a million things today with we, that. We should celebrate when, yes. when people say, I want to be righteous. Uh, that should be something that is everyone stands up and applauds. Yes, uh, by all means, yes. be righteous. In Denton, Texas, there's another family getting some attention. 16-year-old college junior Emma Earhart and her mom, Kathy, take every single college class together. Mm. They say they both want to be doctors someday. Take a look at their story. If you're looking for inspiration, head to a college campus. Anyway, what do I have on the board? What do you call that? Shouldn't it be called cyclopropane? Every student, every dream is different. Put a methyl group pointing in the direction opposite from where the two OH groups are pointing. Some here sooner than the rest. People don't know unless I tell them. And then they're usually shocked. And they're like, wow, OK, good job. <laughs> Pictures from Emma Earhart's life tell the tale of a typical teen. But when you hear her story, you'll learn what makes her unique. How long were you in high school? I went for three days. <laughs> <laughs> and then I left. <laughs> At 16 years old, she's already a high school and junior college grad, now a biology major at the University of North Texas. When did you get your associate's degree? I was 15. When will you get your bachelor's degree? 17. When will you get your doctorate? <laughs> um, 22. It's inspiring to me. Uh, and, and I'm a 48 year old man. Emma's dad, Joe, told me his daughter took the SAT at age 12. She did so well, she was accepted into college. I always say that Emma's on autopilot, and I don't want to jinx her, because she's, she's got focus, she's got drive, ambition. All of you know is that acceleration due to gravity is 9.8. This semester, she's taking 14 credits. When you leave the class, you should have known the difference between velocity and acceleration. She hopes to become a surgeon. We're answering questions that go along with this data. But as she sat in physics lab, she didn't talk about her future. That woman is smart. She talked about this woman. That woman has blonde hair. Her classmate. That woman is good at math. A woman she knows well. And who else is she? <laughs> That woman is my mom. <laughs> I've never seen her in my life, guys. <laughs> this semester, Emma is taking every single class with her mother. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a dermatologist. For more than a decade, Kathy Earhart stayed home raising three kids. But once her daughter started college at 14, she felt inspired. And I was like, OK, I'm doing this. I'm going to do it. If I set my mind to it, I will do it. Now this duo is working toward a bachelor's degree and eventually a doctorate. It's a lot of fun. We're competitive in a fun way. So, you know, it's who did better on this, who did better on that. So we challenge each other. Oh, I have sciences. But amazingly, we don't spend so much time in there. I know we don't. We've grown so close. We've become best friends. Hi, babe. Mwah. How's your day? Good. We thought we'd been eating at Avesta, but apparently we can't read. So we get to try it today. Yeah. Uh, it's a great story. They're each other's support mechanism. I, I just really couldn't be happier. So if you're looking for inspiration, head to a college campus. And if you're looking for the ear hearts, check the classroom. This has been an amazing experience, especially experiencing it with my mother. It's just created a bond that's going to last a lifetime. An amazing wow. story. It sure it's is. never too late to go back. It's never too late. Uh, you can always live your dream, uh, no matter how That's big no that dream is. small dream, yeah. yeah. That's a big dream. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Terry's going to go to med school. Uh, that'd be a no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, still ahead, he's trained as a medical doctor, so why is he working as a bridge builder between Charismatics and the Vatican? He shares his unlikely story. Dr. Richard Roberts was a primary care physician in the UK, and then he was asked to lead a church small group. Well, reluctantly, he did just that. Before long, Richard began to focus on ministry, and he's never looked back. From medical doctor to accidental church planter, Richard Roberts has dedicated his life to serving others and serving Christ. As a charismatic leader in the United Kingdom, his focus is seeing the fulfillment of Jesus' prayer for unity found in John 17. To that end, Dr. Roberts is working with other ministry leaders to build rapport between the Catholic and new charismatic churches. Well, please welcome to the show, Dr. Richard Roberts. And doctor, it's great to have you with us. Thank you. You have a very unlikely background. You grew up in a non-religious home, 
Yeah. Uh, I assume agnostic. Yeah. Um, and yet you became a Christian. How did that happen? Well, it happened in my late teens. Mm -hmm. um, I got interested in Eastern religion and I was about to join a sect, Eastern religious sect. And I thought, but I don't know anything really about Christianity. Mm. So I, uh, I've, I found a church, a uh, Baptist church. I didn't understand what was going on there, uh, but I started reading the Bible and I read a verse in John's Gospel and I felt, yeah, I can really trust Jesus. He's the Lord of life. And What was so the verse? It was, um, he who believes in me believes not only in me, but in him who sent me. So it convinced me that Jesus was the way to God. I mean, it must have been the Holy Spirit that convinced me, not just the words on the page. What happened to you? Well, um, because I wanted to be intellectually sound, I went and read as many books as I could that were against Christianity. Mm -hmm. So I read those books, convinced myself I'd believed a lie, and then I was in my bedroom and I had a, an experience of... The, the presence of God in the room, that was like a thick blanket coming into the room. Now, I knew nothing about these things. I knew nothing about the Holy Spirit. I knew nothing really about Christianity, just that Jesus was Lord, and I had this experience of God. And so I went back to the Baptist church and said, I want to be baptised. And they said to me, but you've got to believe all these other things. So I said, well, just tell me what they are, and I'll believe them. <laughs> <laughs> and then they baptised me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I assume they, they weren't into the gifts of the Spirit, no. the charismatic experience. No. So what then got you into, into that group? Um, I think friends were being filled with the Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it wasn't just happening to you? It, it wasn't just happening to me. Um, and I just, just got involved with, with other people who were involved in the same thing. I went for a time to Pentecostal church because I thought, I've got to find out more about the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was at university. And then a bit later, I got involved with the new sort of independent, non-denominational charismatic churches. And that was over 40 years ago. And here I am today, still involved. Okay. It's real unusual to hear someone say, well, all these experiences started when I was a teenager and then in my undergraduate years. Mm. And then you continued on with your education and you became a doctor. Yeah. Well, why? Well, uh, that's another story. Um, I, when I was doing my, when I was in high school, uh, I had a phobia of blood. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I learned... And you wanted to become a doctor? I, I learned how to faint... Uh, in biology, but to remain conscious by leaning on the desk in a certain way, whenever blood was mentioned. But I felt God wanted me to go to medical school. So I applied to go to medical school, got to medical school, and the day before I needed to learn to take blood, I was prayed for, and God healed me of my blood phobia. But until then, I was thinking, I'm going to have to give this up when I get on the wards. So uh, it, it made me realize that you have to trust God. You have to trust the call of God, even when you feel inadequate and out of your depth. And I felt inadequate especially, and out of my depth especially. ever since. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Everything I do, I'm out of my depth. Absolutely. Uh, and it's all about him. Well, uh, how did you become a church planner then? Uh, well, we, we, we had people um, meeting in our living room, uh, praying. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, they weren't uh, part of another church. And um, so I just felt responsible for them. And I, I spent years looking for some, I thought God would send somebody along who knows how to lead a church. And then he didn't. So I had to carry on with that. <laughs> so I carried on with that for over 20 years. What got you involved with the Catholic Church? Because you're trying, you're trying to unite uh, what yeah. seemingly seem, it seems to be divided yes without repair yes we we like our we like to be in our silos we like mm -hmm. to be in our tribes and but i've got friends who have been involved with charismatic catholics and friends from mm -hmm. new churches for a long long time and uh, so um 
I was drawn into the um, conversations with the Vatican um, because uh, I think they, my friends thought that I might be able to speak Catholic. <laughs> because so, so often we, we're to, we, we might be talking about the same thing, mm -hmm. Just using but we different use words. different language. Yeah. So I was brought in as an interpreter. And that was, uh, well, it was originally meant to be 2010, but our flight was delayed due to a volcanic ash cloud. And so 2012... Uh, up to this year, I've been involved. I have found that when uh, people share the same experience, yeah. that even though their words are different, uh, they can find commonality yes. in the experience. Well, I think the thing is, um, when Peter was at the house of Cornelius, they were Gentiles. Hmm. He didn't know where the Gentiles could be in the church. Right. The spirit fell on them. They began to speak in tongues. And then he realized God has included them in. So wh whoever God's included in, we can't exclude. Amen. If we draw a circle around ourselves or our ministry or our church or our denomination, it'll be a very small circle. We need to draw a circle around Jesus and that'll be a very big circle. Yeah. I like to put it that when I, when I go to different churches and different denominations, I like to say, I'm one of you. Yes. Um, I'm one of you. I am. Uh, I don't, I don't want to create some separate tribe over here. No. I'm, I'm one of you. Yeah. I'm, we, we I'm want, part of you. We want to acknowledge our differences, and there are differences. Yes. But we have so much in common. We believe in the Trinity. We believe the power of Jesus to cleanse us from sin. We believe salvation is faith. Yeah. Grace. And we believe in the resurrection of the we dead. We believe in the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> in the Second resurrection of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. I mean, you get those things straight. And yeah. yeah. I'm one of you. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. We're, we're brothers and sisters first because God has brought us into his family. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we exclude people from God's family, then that's doing them a huge disservice. And we'll have a very lonely heaven. We will. We'll have to tiptoe past all the Catholics and Methodists. <laughs> All right. Well, Dr. Robert, Richard Roberts, thank you for being with us. And you can find out more information about how you can get involved by going to CBN.com. Terry, over to you. Like a tree near death. That's how this mother described herself. Find out how she got new life and doubled her income when we come back. Does worrying about money keep you awake at night? Well, it did the single mother in our next story. How on earth could she pay back all the money she owed? Then one day, she was stunned to find out the answer was right in her own backyard. Oh, is a single mom raising her young son alone. Her husband abandoned them before Tao was born. Tao means everything to me. When life is difficult, he inspires me to press on. O oh, works part-time at a restaurant to buy food for her son and elderly mother. She's had to borrow for other things, like clothes and school fees. I get stressed, and I worry about how I will pay the money that I owe. I can't seem to find a way out. My daughter could not sleep at night. I wanted to help, but did not know how. Then Grandma Na suffered an aneurysm and was hospitalized for two months. O oh, borrowed more money to pay the medical bills. When I saw her hospital bills, I was shocked. I owed so much money, more than $2,000. I did everything I could to keep my mom alive. I saw my mom cry. I felt so sad for her. Then a neighbor told O oh about CBN's Orphan's Promise. We poured a concrete floor and installed other items needed to start a small restaurant at her house. O's income has doubled, and she has paid off her mom's medical bills. My life was like a tree that was near death. Then Orphan's Promise came and gave us new life through my new business. Meanwhile, Grandma Na is back on her feet and helping O prepare food for the restaurant. Now. I see my mom and my son smiling every day. You helped our family and brought a bright light into our lives. Thank you. 
You gave new life to this little family. Isn't it amazing what we can do when we link hands together and say, let's change the world for Jesus Christ. Join with us. Join the 700 Club, 1-800-700-7000, 65 cents a day, $20 a month. We want you to be a part of what God's doing around the world. Gordon? Here's a closing verse from 2 Peter. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. May God bless you and may you understand that his divine power has granted to you everything you need. God bless. We'll see you again.